Hello everyone, I uh, hope you are doing well. Welcome back again to this online uh, Structural Geology NPTEL course. Uh, this is our last week, that is uh, week number 12 and we are in our lecture number 33. As we have concluded in the last lecture of the previous week that we more or less have learnt the basics of Structural Geology. Uh, since the very beginning we understood the different processes, uh, then we understood uh, stress, strain, we learned how to measure deep and strike different structural elements. Out of that we moved to the rheology, the deformation mechanism and after that we learned a series of uh, important structures, their characteristics, geometries, how to interpret them and these included uh, fold, fault, joints, budinaj and so on. In this lecture, we will particularly focus on the basics of lithostructural mapping. As a geologist, it is very, very important that he or she knows the basics or the methods of geological mapping. Nowadays, there are many uh, techniques which are digitized or there are many equipments which are essentially helpful or reduces time and also uh, you do not have to go to the field always, some, you can use some satellite images and uh, you can use uh, several techniques or modeling techniques to interpret some very interesting geological features that sometimes you cannot interpret going to the field. But uh, as an undergraduate student, it is important that you understand the basics of uh, structural geology and its mapping techniques. This lecture would particularly focus on that. Uh, having said this, uh, I must say that st structural mapping or geological mapping is something that one has to learn in the field. And because this is an online course, it is not possible uh, to demonstrate all these techniques. Uh, what I have uh, included in this lecture is mostly some very basics in the sense that so far we have learnt about the structures, their geometries and so on. Uh, these we mostly considered uh, about their geometries, their dispositions and so on and we restricted them inside a block diagram, either in three dimension or two dimensions. Now, we have not considered that how they would look like in the field. Well, we have seen some uh, outcrop patterns of superposed folds and so on. Also, we, we learnt about uh, them in the fault uh, lectures. But again, uh, the surfaces that we constructed that this would be the map view was essentially uh, flat surfaces, is not it? But you know that earth surface is not flat. Even within 10 or 15 meters, uh, it can be extremely undulatory. And therefore, the interaction of the structures with the earth surface is something very important to consider and understand to particularly figure out the local and regional structures. In this lecture, we will we'll mostly focus on that and we will figure out the processes that one can have some ideas about uh, lithostructural mapping. We will learn some very basics will not go into the complex uh, structures, we even do not go even deformed uh, structures. For example, we will not going to include fold, fault and so on, but we mostly restrict ourselves on a flat uh, bed which is dipping differently and we will see how and why we can interpret different structural features out of it. Continuing this, we will we'll learn in this lecture some very basic formats and composition of a geological map. Then we will try to understand what is topography and its interaction with the lithology and mostly bedding planes or any planar fabrics that how they interact with each other. After that, we will see when you are discussing this topography and lithology, we will we'll discover that there is something very interesting which is rule of V's. And finally, we will we'll figure out that even if a bed or 
a feature is not exposed on the surface that where you cannot measure dip and strike, but you can have the line which is connecting the two different lithologies on the surface of the earth, which is contoured, which is uh, which has a topography, then how to uh, calculate the strike and dip with the help of structural contour. So, let us start with the very first idea and the books I have suggested you uh, at the very beginning of these lectures may not be very, very helpful in understanding this lecture or uh, future analysis related to structural maps and so on. So, here are three books that I uh, personally like and I also would like to recommend these books for this particular class and also uh, for your future references. The first one is Geological Structures and Maps uh, written by uh, Professor Richard Lyle. This is uh, published from Elsevier, third edition 2004. The second book is Structural Analysis and Synthesis. Uh, it is written by Roland Etel, published in 2007 from Blackwell. And the third one is, is one of the latest ones. It, it talks about geological field techniques. Angela Coy edited this book along with four or three co-authors, I exactly do not remember, but this is published in 2010 and uh, it is it, it's from Wiley and uh, Blackwell. Now, I personally would recommend the first book a must to have if you would like to continue with geological mapping and to be very specific with the structural geology. The second and third book interestingly uh, deal with many, many uh, techniques that you should learn in the field. It, it, it gives you the very basic ideas, what is deep, what is strike, how to measure it, how to hold the compass, how to take the reading, how to take the reading on the notebook, how to interpret them, how to construct things in the field directly and so on. These are very handful, but again, these are not the scope of this lecture. I hope uh, in future I can uh, come up with another uh, course. Uh, I have to design it differently uh, on geological mapping and so on, particularly with the emphasis of structural elements. But uh, these three books are very, very important and in this lecture, whatever I am going to show you is mostly derived from the book of Professor Lyle. The illustrations and diagrams, I have redrawn it, but it is essentially uh, from his book. So, what is a geological map? You know all this, uh, what is, but this is how more or less you can define it, a geological map or describe it in a way, it, uh, you, you, you do not have to define everything. A geological map shows the distribution of various types of bedrock in an area. The map is usually prepared over a topographic map which takes into account the various forms and elevation depression of the earth surface. In the map, the different lithologies are generally shaded or colored or symboled with or without structural data and may other data to show where different rock units occur at or just below the ground surface. So, many things are written here, uh, let us let us take the highlights of, of these statements. So, first of all, a geological map essentially gives you the surficial data, maybe few meters or few tens of meters and so on. So, what you see on the surface is essentially included in, in, in the geological map. Looking at a geological map, you may not conclude what is happening at 10 or 15 kilometers down or even 1 kilometer down, it may be completely different. And then therefore, a geological map essentially represents the various features, various rock types that you see in the field and you, you compose them together with the different uh, rock types that you have seen, their contacts and so on. And generally the map, if it is very large scale map, it is done over a topographic map, which you can consider that this is a reference of your uh, area. And the topographic map is, is very, very useful. We have a couple of slides on topography and its uh, topographic map and its usefulness and so on. So generally large scale maps are drawn over topography, topographic maps. but uh, you can also consider uh, plane paper mapping and so on. If you have to do a very detailed mapping in say a 10 meters by 10 meters area, then topographic map is not that much useful because topographic maps are generally very large scale. Again, these are different techniques, but there are uh, large scale mapping and plane paper mapping. In large scale mapping, you need the help of topographic map, but in plane paper mapping, no. 
the primary thing in, in a geological map is mostly the, the lithological contacts and their disposition on the surface. But if say a lithological contact is, is faulted, then you can use some symbols and therefore you start introducing the structural elements on your map. Or maybe you have series of uh, lithologies, uh, planar lithologies and they are dipping to a certain direction. So, you can include the strike and dip in the map and therefore you again introduce the different structural features. For example, you you see that in the field this is a sin form, so you can use the symbol of sin form, you can use the symbol of antiform and so on and by this you slowly add many, many, many information as much as you can based on your need uh, to the geological map. People also add many other features say geophysical measurements, say you can add density, you can add uh, many other uh, features conductivity in the corresponding to particular lithology or particular feature of your map. So, a geological map is essentially very, very important not only for geologists, not only for interpreting the structure or regional tectonics or know what is there, but it is essentially important also for engineers for constructing dams or uh, buildings or roads and so on. So, yes, this is very, very important. Uh, we have to learn how to read and how to uh, interpret and how to prepare it as a geologist that is a primary job of us. So, here is an example of a geological map. I took it from Geological Survey of India and this is what you see the map of Sikkim. It is a state in the northeastern part of India. So, the state is like this. This part is uh, the whitish part that you see. These were snow covered and people could not uh, figure out the lithology and so on. But you see that this map shows very nicely the different lithologies with different colors. So, this pink has a different lithology, this purple has a different lithology, this red has a different lithology, this gray has a different lithology and they are disposed in a, in, in a different way in the map. And you can see many other maps just type ge geological map and you will see many different features in this map. Also, you can see that uh, here these the structural data are included there the deep and strike are included here and so on. So, this also tells you a very, very important information about this area and a geological map essentially comes with something called legend. So, you have to explain what are the different colors or what the different symbols are, you have to explain what are the different uh, features that you are using, the line drawings and so on. These are also very important and finally, what is most important in any geological map is that you provide the scale. This is very important, we will we'll learn about it that what scale I am looking at that if I measure 2 centimeters in this map that means how much I am measuring in the real scale. Is it 100 meters, is it 1 kilometer or is it 4 kilometers or even more. And this is also very important that you indicate what is the direction of north. Sometimes people indicate the direction of north at the same time they indicate also the latitudes and longitudes in the map that also tells you where exactly in the earth you, you have mapped or the map is located. So, these are the very important aspects of this map apart from the different colors uh, indicating different lithologies, the different symbols of structural data and so on. You have to have a legend, you have to have scale in your map you have to assign what is the north direction and if possible in the map you also if it is a large scale map you suggest what is the uh, latitude and longitude your mapping area is. Now, how this map is constructed again I am not going into the detail, but I tell you it is not a very easy task. So, there are a series of processes a geologist in the field first uh, has to go and then uh, he has to record the nature of rock where it is visible at the surface and it is not visible everywhere that is uh, quite common. Then rock outcrops and characteristics such as rock composition, distribution and relationship of structural elements, fossil content etcetera, etcetera. The geologist do record uh, in his notebook and so on and nowadays maybe in the mobile phone or laptop or with some digital mapping softwares. Now, using all these details the geologist then distinguishes different units in the field that he or she has seen and then he tries to plot them separately in the map or on the base of the uh, topographic map. Now, the geologist can include some additional information for example, geophysical data, 
is taken into account when the geology decide to add other parameters like density, strength, seismic velocity and so on on the map. Nevertheless, there are always parts of the map where more uncertainty exists about the nature of the bedrock and it is important for the reader of the map to realize that a good deal of interpretation is used in the map mapping processes. What I mean by this that it comes actually from this place that where it is visible at the surface. You do not see rocks everywhere, but you map it and then you use your intelligence to interpret that if I see this rock here and if I see the same rock here how they are connected. Maybe your interpretation is wrong, but based on your experience, based on your intelligence, based on your theoretical background, you conclude this is how it should be. Someone can challenge it, but this is how we always work. But once you look at a geological map, you be sure that a lot of uh, uncertainties are involved in this map. So, do not take any map as granted unless, uh, I mean particularly if it is really required for some very special job. So, better you go to the field, match it that yes, this is what is happening. Otherwise, you take it if it is uh, from a good source. And final part is of course, the interpretation that once you have a geological map, this is a job done, but after the map is ready, then it is very important that you interpret the structure, you interpret the feature, you interpret the lithology and so on, but this is something else that you would learn in a different class or different lectures. So, as I was talking about, there are many modern techniques which are very, very useful, but it is also important as a student, you go to the field with your field instructor, with your teacher and learn how to hold a compass, learn how to take back bearing, learn how to take front bearing. Uh, you take your steps with, with a measuring tape and then do different techniques because not always, not everywhere you'll, you can use all these modern techniques. So, let us talk about the topographic map for a while. Uh, you know that what is a topo map, we generally call it topo map or topo sheet. Uh, so, uh, topographic maps represent numerically the complex curves and elevations of earth's surface with the contour lines. Now, a contour line is a line joining the points of equal elevation on a surface and the contour lines uh, represent uh, the intersection of those curves with imaginary horizontal surfaces at regular intervals. We will see topographic map and other things with, with some uh, good illustrations later, but a contour line or a series of contour lines uh, should have some very special characters because the contour lines indicate equal elevation on a surface every point along a contour line is the exact same elevation. Contour lines therefore, uh, can never cross each other. So, if you see a contour map going like this, going like that and then another contour map like this, then this is something very, very strange and you discard the map immediately. So, this is not something you should look at. A contour line must close on itself. So, that is also something that you need to see. Maybe it is not closing in your map area, but it has to close somewhere and the lowest closing point is of course, the sea level, we will see that. The map distance between two adjacent contour lines may vary, but their elevation difference should remain constant. What I mean by that, that say you have a contour line going like this and you write this is say 80 meters, then you have the next contour line something like that, this is 70 meters. And this is you are seeing on a map, say this is you have a scale for that. So, in the map scale, this distance and this distance is essentially different, but the change of elevation from here to here is 10 meters and here to here is as well 10 meters. So, it does not matter how far the contour lines are, but two adjacent contour lines always should represent a very similar elevation and that gives you an another idea when the two adjacent contour lines are closely spaced, that means this is steeper compared to when they are spaced far from each other, that means they have a gentle slope, we will see this soon. So, the use of topographic map is very significant and topographic map also do contain significant information. It tells you about the roads, buildings, urban development, railways, airports, names of the places and geological features geographical features. 
then administrative boundaries, state and international boundaries, uh, reserves and so on. It also tells you about the water bodies of this area like lakes, rivers, streams, swamps, uh, coastal flats, etc., etc. It also tells you because it is a topographic map about the relief of this region, say mountains, valleys, contours and cliffs, depressions, basins and so on. It also tells you about the vegetation of this area. So, whether this area is a jungle, wooded area, reserve forest, vineyard land or orchard and so on, all these things, all these information you get from topographic map. So, a topographic map, it is not necessarily we geologists use, uh, it is used in every community, particularly those who deal uh, with the nature. In addition to that, geological structures such as bedding, contacts, faults and folds also do interact and intersect the topography along some lines and this is exactly what we are going to learn in this lecture after a while. So, topographic maps generally come with different scales and the scales are given generally in this form that what topographic map you have and I said 1 to 50,000. What does it mean? Uh, it means that 500 meters is equal to 1 centimeter. So, this is how is it given. So, if I tell that I have a map of 1 to 50,000, that means in the map, if I measure 1 centimeter by my scale or ruler, that distance represents 500 meters in the actual area. So, similarly, you can have 1 to 20,000 that means 200 meters, 1 to 24,000 that means 240 meters and so on and then finally, 1 to 20 lakh ratio that means 1 centimeter in the map is equivalent to 20 kilometers in the region. So, this column represents uh, these things in uh, centimeters or meter scale and there it is inch and mile scale. So, very similarly 20 kilometers in 1 to 20 lakh map, scaled map it, it should be 1 inch in the map if you can measure that represents about 32 miles in the actual area. There are some terminologies uh, that involves in the topographic map. So, we learned few of them, but let us have a look in, in this list. So, contour lines, contour lines are iso lines that show equal elevation on a map at defined intervals, this we have learned. Then magnetic north, not according to the earth's magnetic poles rather than its geographic poles. Therefore, if you have a magnetic pole, then you must have a declination. So, declination from the true north is given in mils, where 1 mil is equal to 1 divided by 6400 of 360 degrees. The true north is the geographic north and this is what we all understand when we talk about north. Declination we have learned, so a measurement of the degree to which a grid or magnetic north varies from the true, true north. Then grid is a network of uniformly spaced lines on the face of a map intersecting at right angles and usually running north, south and east, west. Grids are often numbered and can be used to define position by rectangular coordinates and grids generally does not care about the contour lines. So, it does not matter how steep uh, the slope is or how gentle the slope is or whether it is flat or not, grids ignore everything and generally run uh, either north south or east west or if you have defined them in a different way. And then you have meridian, meridian is a starting point or line, usually a line of longitude for a numbering system, keep the numbers continued uh, to the section uh, of, of the arc into a grid. Now, this is how the topographic maps are indexed. So, this is uh, our India. So, India is generally gridded with these numbers. For example, we can have this 45 here or 63 and so on. Then this is a single grid. Now, within this grid, you actually divide this grid in 16 subgrids. and then you define them as it is written here a b c d e f g h up to p and then each of this grids a for example here it is given here then again you subdivide it by 16 grids and then you again number them 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and so on so this process continues so for example if i want map of d here then i have to say that i need 55 d 
and if you need a map of 55 d3 that means you have this grid 55 then you have this d and then d is divided again in 16 segments and then you are looking for something here so more numbers and alphabets you add to your topo map more high resolution you go with the, with the mapping process and the topo map as well has legends so these are the different things that you see in the topographic map so it's important when you look at it for the first time you actually read this and see what is what that's that's also important so that that once you read it will it you'll remember so you don't have to look back every time unless you forget uh, but it's important once you read a map you you see what it is and not necessarily in each and every map you see this legend is attached maybe you scan something or you crop something and then the scanner thought that okay legends are not important so he cut it out or cropped it out and you don't have it so it's better you remember what is what now this is how a topographic map looks like so this is uh, something digitally constructed so you see the colors are varying so the highest elevation is marked by red and slowly it's going to the uh, cooler colors to the blue and you see that these black lines these are actually making your equal elevations in this region but this image here is representing in a much better way so what we see here we have a valley a river is flowing through this valley and we have two little elevations here we also see that in this elevation the slope is going down here the slope is going down here it's going down this side this is one of the maximum elevations we see we also see that slope is here very gentle here the slope is extremely high we also see some little rivers or whatever channels are flowing along these valleys and so on and this is where you have the sea and on the sea you have also some cliffs where the slope is almost perpendicular now if i have to represent in the topographic map then it looks like this so here you see that it is contoured and by this you can actually figure out though it's a map view but you can figure out towards which direction the slope is changing for example this is 260 this is 200 this is 100 so you can clearly figure out that this is how the slope is decreasing and once you know that then you can also figure out that this is how it is decreasing here but here you see the spacing is much much higher compared to the spacing here so this is a steep slope and this is exactly what we have seen here now this yes the river is flowing and we also see that here we have the highest elevation and at highest elevation if you see a concentric circle that is the highest elevation of this region and that must be closed by a circle and then the other contours should follow it in different ways but this is how it is now it is also important that you train your eyes so when you look a topographic map you, you try to visualize that what is the uh, elevation of, of that region so i have given four examples here so two are in this slide so the first column is the outcrop map or plan view and you see here from 50 that's the lowest elevation in meters to 300 it is going so 300 is the highest peak here and here is the highest point and it is uh, marked by a concentric circle now if i have to make a cross section from a to b of this region then i should get something like this so if i see something like that and the values are given then it should be like this now if the values are opposite way for example this one is 300 and this one is 50 then uh, a to b in this case uh, should be something like that so these are actually depressions but here the values are increasing uh, towards the core of this contour so this is you have two hillocks here one hillock this one another hillock this one so this one and this one very similarly you see here as i talked about so here we start again at 50 and end up 350 meters in this side the contours are closely spaced in this side contours are not that closely spaced so here the slope is very gentle here the slope is extremely steep so just you look at this contour pattern and you can figure out uh, what is the uh, section or how it should look like when you actually see them in the field this is another one so you see we have two concentric circles but this concentric circle closes at 200 meters and this closes at 350 meters so therefore this must be of higher elevation 
compared to this and if you make a section you actually can see that this is your 350 and this is somewhere is your 200. So, this is how you actually visualize and this is another one we have a single peak and we get a single peak here. We will see in one of the next slides that how to construct this elevation map profile map from this contour maps and this is exactly where it is. So, we will have a lab demonstration on this, but I explain you briefly. So, whenever you see a topographic map and if you have to draw the profile, the first thing you have to decide that from which section you would like to draw the profile. For example, here the profile should be drawn along this line. So, this is x and this is y. Now, we have series of contour lines. So, for example, this contour line is 75 meters and then this contour line is closing here and then we have 150 meters here which is this one and if this is 150, this is 75, then this one should be even lower. But if we do this, then we can figure out that it is cutting across this x y line the number of contours. So, what you do? You take a strip of paper which is this one and align the edge of this paper along x y line and once you align it, then you mark this places or points where it is intersecting the contour line. So, here for example, number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. Once you are done, then it is important that you draw a Cartesian coordinate system, where your horizontal axis should be the distance x, y and this should be your elevations. And this distance you can fix by yourself depending on the scale you would like to see but make sure that these are all equal. Say for example, you can figure out that this is 75 meter, this is 150 meters and so on. Now, you arrange your strip here, this paper strip that you have, where you have marked this 1, then 2, then 3, then 4 and then 5 intersections of the strip of the paper. So, this comes here. And you see that at 1, your value is almost at the sea level. So, because this is sea, so this is close to 0. So, at 1, you have somewhere here. Then at point 2, here the value is 75 meter. So, you have to plot a point here at 75 meter. At 3, your value is 150 meters, the value of the point 3. So, you come here and the value is 150 meters. At 4, again this contour is coming back and we are at 150 meters. So, we come here and plot it like this. And then at 5, again we are touching the 75 contour. So, it is like this. Of course, you can grid your map first so that you do not have to do it, but once you are expert, you can do it just by putting your scale accordingly the way you need. But these are the points that we got and simply you can connect these points like this. Now, here you can make it flat or you can make it little curved, there is no harm. So, this is the elevation or profile along x y line of this. So, does not matter how is your uh, topography, and so on. You can cross section say A to B, say this is 20, this is 30, this is 40, this is 50 and this is 60. So, if you draw a profile along this again, you have to put a strip paper, paper strip here. So, you mark this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, this point and so on. You go on and then you again may make your grid and then you know the values you plot it, you will get series of points and then you are done. But we will have little lab demonstration on this uh, that how to uh, construct the profile 
from a topographic map. Now, let us come to a very important part that so far we have figured out what is topographic map, how to get the profile and so on. But you may have different lithologies which are intersecting or interacting with the topography. For example, if you have a flat horizontal bed and if you have a flat topography, then you do not see the other beds which is below the flat bed because it is only single bed you will see because bed is flat, topography is flat. Now, if your bed is again flat, but your topography is in a particular slope, in a very gentle slope, then topography would go down and at one point of time it would cut the contact between one bed to other bed. So, other bed will be exposed on the topography. And this can be a valley topography, a mountain topography and so on. So, there are three possibilities that you have horizontal beds with one is flat topography, slope topography and valley topography. Then you can have uniformly dipping beds and again you can have flat topography, slope topography and valley topography. And this is exactly what rule of V is, we will learn about it soon. But let us try to understand this process in, in, in a better way. Say for example, you have a bed here like this which is the green one which is sloping and this is some other rocks. So, we have a bed which is sloping in this way and then you have some other rocks around this. Now, with time what can happen? It can erode uniformly. So, you see that this got eroded and because this bed is sloping, then you can clearly see that this is a horizontal surface. So, you see that you have say lithology A, then lithology B and again lithology A. So, you have A, then B, then A and they are absolutely fine, no problem. Now, if the erosion happens and you get a slopey topography, so the topography is uniformly sloping here as you can see here. So, this is the slope. Then you of course, generate some contour lines, right? These white dotted lines are your contour lines. And again, there is no variation here except the bed thickness changed on the exposed surface area. But now, if there is a river flowing here as we see here, so it would cut a gorge or make a canyon or whatever, then the question is how on this river valley this bed would look like, right? Because it would have also contours like this. So, would it look like this or would it be a straight line, straight bed or it would be like this and so on. You may guess how it should look like, but there is a rule and this rule is known as rule of V's. We will see this soon, but before that let us see some other interesting features. What do we see here in the first image or first illustration that is the surface of the earth for example, which has a flat sloping surface. And then you have two different lithologies say this is A the green one and this light cream one is B. And their contact is somewhere here. So, when it intersects like this and this is the topography, so this is the lowest elevation that you can see here 20 meters and it goes up to 90 meters towards this direction. And this is the line it is cutting or intersecting the topography, the boundary between A and B. So, in this side you have A and in this side you have B. You can also see that if this topography is not as flat as we have seen or maybe a river is flowing along this, then we have very similar thing A and B the beds are dipping exactly similar way. So, to strike and dip of these two contacts, lithological contacts are very, very similar. 
but if I change the topography in, in this case if I have an undulatory topography, then the interaction of this topography with this uniformly dipping bed would be along this line. right? So, here you have A and here you have B. So, if I try to see them, this is a block diagram, if I see, see them in a topographic map, their appearance would be something like this if I have to plot it. So, here because the topography is flat, we clearly see that the flat bed interacting uniformly dipping bed which, which has no deformation, it is not folded or something like that, this is very much straight line. But same flat bed if the topography is undulating then which is given by this little red dashed lines then it is not any more a straight line. So, there must be happening something and I would like to also uh, emphasize the fact that we have already talked about that you see here this appears like V or in this case this is like a V with, with a mirror image. So, we will learn about it later. So, we see here that same bed, but in one case we have flat topography, another place we have undulatory topography and we may have two different intersections on the uh, topographic map. But if we have same topography, but the bed is dipping differently, then what should be the condition? Here are the examples. The first one again we have A and B, the bed is dipping very gently. Okay, you can see that this is the deep of the bed, this is a lithological boundary and this is the topography where you have some river network and the interaction would be something like this. If the bed is moderately dipping in this case, the interaction is something like this with the topography on the surface and if the bed is highly dipping, then the interaction is something like this. So, in the topographic map, we see them differently. So, same topography, but bed is dipping in different ways. The appearance or exposures of these topographic maps would be completely different. So, this is the take home message from this slide and the previous slide. And based on that, our geologists have constructed the rule of phi. Again, you see that this is a V, this is again going to be a V and this is a V of different shape and so on. Let us see how does it look like. Now, we will look at uh, the V rules and, and we will we'll, we'll look after one uh, and then the next one and then we have six. Uh, illustrations to demonstrate what is the V rule. But before we go to the actual V rule, let us talk about what does it say to us. So, the first illustration in all uh, figures you will see that on the left hand side that means this one is like a V block that we use in the lathe machine something like that. But this has a slope say for example, this contour may have 100 meters, this is uh, say 10 meter spacing, so 110, then 120, then 130 and then 140. So, from here to here we have a change of elevation of about 40 meters and then the contours are running like this inside the valley and you can imagine that a river is flowing in this direction. So, this is the downstream and essentially then this would be the upstream. So, river itself has a slope and this is also maintain a slope, the walls of the valley and this is horizontal. So, with this concept we will first look what happens if we have a horizontal bed in this condition. So, horizontal bed means that this dip is 0 here. And we see if the bed is horizontal, then the V rule suggests and this is the uh, top view on the topographic map. So, this is the topo map. So, the way the horizontal bed would intersect the valley or it, it is something like this. So, it would the V that would be created, it would point upstream. So, this is exactly what we see here 
and the angle of V is very similar to the angle of the contours or contour lines we can think of. So, if this is alpha then this has to be also alpha. What would happen if the bed is vertical is given in the next slide. If we have a vertical bed that means this is 90 degree and again this is the downstream that is the upstream and the vertical bed interestingly would not produce any V in this section in the top view or in the topo map view. So, it would not be influenced by any of the contour lines and it would run straight as it was. Now, if we have the beds which are dipping along the slope of the stream, that means the stream has a slope along which it is flowing and the bed also has a very similar slope of the stream. So, this is the deep of the bed and this is also the stream the way it is flowing. So, if this is the horizontal line if I can reproduce it here. So, this angle and this angle are very similar. In that case the V rule suggests that you would not produce any V shape. However, the two projections of the beds on this V they would slowly try to intersect towards the downstream. If the bed is gently dipping towards the downstream. So, this dip is very very low, low angle dipping bed. This is again the downstream then the V would be something like that and in the plan view it would be very interesting that when it was horizontal we saw that this angle of the V and this angle of the V were equal. But in this case if the bed is gently dipping towards the downstream then the angle made by the bed inside the valley the V angle if this is alpha and if this is alpha 1 then alpha is less than alpha 1. So, V points also upstream in this case and it is also sharper than the contour lines. Now, if we have a steeply dipping bed towards the downstream, so bed the deep of the bed is very high. In that case we will see that V is pointing downstream in this manner. Now, we will look at something very interesting that how we can figure out the strike and then the dip of the bedding plane which is uniformly dipping inside the surface and it is intersecting with different topographies. And if we remember the definition of the strike, then you can figure out the fact that strike was nothing but the intersection of an inclined plane with the horizontal plane and the horizontal plane is imaginary. So, they would produce a line, the azimuth of the line is the strike. So, from that idea of the definition of strike, we actually can construct on the topographic map even if we do not go to the field, if we have this intersection line on the topographic map of a bedding plane, then we can construct something what is known as structural contour. So, if a dipping surface crosses valleys and ridges, we can construct strike lines which are known as structural contours to precisely determine the strike. Now, a map showing outcrops of a surface together with topographic contours can be used to construct structure of contours for that surface. And when we construct these structural contours, it has two underlying principles. The first principle is where a surface crops out, the height of the surface equals the height of the topography. So, that means if I have an intersection point between the contour line of a particular value and also the intersection line of the two surfaces on the earth surface. Then if I find a similar point somewhere and if I connect these two points, so these two points would have also very similar elevation value. And if the height of a planar surface is known at a minimum of three places, the structure contours for that surface can be constructed. 
So let's see how does it work. I think instead of reading the text, let's do this directly. We have seen this illustration before. This was an uniformly dipping bed. So what is important to draw the contour lines, structural contour lines that you have to figure out the intersection between a fixed value contour line, for example, this 20 meters with the intersection of the two lithologies which is coming up on the surface. So in this case, this is one point and this is one point. So these two points are relevant for 20 meter contour lines. Now interestingly, if this point is A and this point is B, as both point A and B are falling on the contour line, so the elevation of A and B should be same. At the same time, this point A and B also showing you the fact that the elevation of underlying bed or the intersection between these two layers, this green and creamy layer also has same elevation values at these two points. So I can actually construct a line like this and this line indicates that this bed has or this litho boundary has an elevation of 20 meters. Let us go to the next contour which is 30 meters. Now again in a similar principle we can figure out that where this contour is intersecting the boundaries between the two lithologies. So in this case it is here and this is coming around and in this case this is also here. So similarly if I consider this A1 and B1 then point A1 and point B1 has similar elevation and because these two points are sitting at the intersection between the two lithologies, so the lithology itself has also similar elevation. So I can draw another line here suggesting that this is 20 meters, this is 30 meters. These two lines indicates that the boundary between the two litho units have similar elevation along these lines. Similarly, we can construct for the 40, so 40 meters contour, so it goes like this, comes back here, again to draw a line like this. We can figure out the 50 meters here and then it goes and it comes here again. Interestingly, this 50 meters also crosses another point here and that is actually the perfect one because now we have three points. So we can construct a line of same elevation of this plane and this is of 50 meter, this was of 40 meter. We can similarly do for 60 meters here, here and it is coming here and again it is possible that we can. What is interesting you see that these lines are parallel to each other, dotted lines that we have drawn this 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters and 60 meters suggesting the elevation of the bed or of the lithological contact, these are parallel. So first hand they are telling you that the bed is uniformly dipping and the next one is 80 meters and it is also running parallel. Now these lines, what these lines actually do signify? They signify as I talked about that the same elevation of the bedding plane. The contour lines that we have seen here, these, these do indicate same elevation on an undulatory surface and these lines indicate the same elevation of contact or lithological boundaries or a bedding plane or an uniformly dipping plane and these are known as structural contours. And we see that these lines actually are horizontal lines at different elevations. So the bed is inclined and I have their intersection line 
on the horizontal plane which are all these lines. So, this line the orientation of this line if this is is the strike line as well. So, in this case the strike line is oriented east west. So, this is how you construct the strike lines and if we have to see it in a different form it is something like that. So, you can construct series of structural contours and structural contours are essentially different to that of the topographic contours unless I let you decide what it is. Okay. There should be a specific condition say for example, okay, I tell you if the bed is horizontal then the structural contour should be exactly similar to that of your uh, topographic contour. Now, this is how we have constructed the strike and now we will learn how to figure out the deep angle of the bedding plane or the litho contact from the structural contours. So, first thing you have to do you have to draw the uh, structural contours. So, in this case this figure this is figure A shows a set of structural contours for the surface defined by the base of a sandstone bed. This example I took from the book of Lyle this is the north direction. So, if this is the structural contour then the strike is 120 degrees. So, this is the strike line. So, from north if you count it would be 120 degrees. Now, to find the angle of dip we must calculate the inclination of a line on the surface at right angles to the strike. So, the dip we have to calculate at a right angle of the strike line that is the definition the true dip. Now, one can be confused here that which way the dip direction is it is on this side or it is on this side. Now, that is not very tough job because you see that structural contour is increasing this side here it is 160 here it is 210. So, that means the, the bed must be dipping in this side not in this side. So, dip direction is towards this side. Now, to figure out the dip angle what you have to do? So, this is the section that we will be working on you simply have to draw a line like this say A B and once the scale is given you can have this distance and in a very similar way the way we walked on the paper strip and so on you can actually figure out this thing. So, it first cuts 180 then 190 then 200 and then 210. At this point it cuts here say it cuts here say this 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3 and this is 4. So, it is possible that you can get a line like this and the slope of this line is actually the dip. Now, how to calculate the slope of course, you know the distance and you know this distance as well from the scale. So, dip angle as it is written here is related to the spacing of the contours that is tangent or angle of dip is contour interval. So, in this case this is 10 meters divided by spacing on map between the contours and this is exactly what you can figure out. So, once you know the dip and strike from the topographic map these kind of basics actually help you to understand the problems like three point problems and so on particularly when people do borehole in an area they do not see the actual rock. So, what I mean by this let us do a very simple block diagram. Say you have a dipping plane at the sub surface and this is of your interest and what you are doing you are doing some boreholes say you have done one borehole here you get something here you get something here and maybe one here you get something here. So, every time you touch your desired bed at different points. So, here on the plan you actually have three points 
where you touch the desired bed at three different values say x, y and z. And if you are sure that this is an uniformly dipping bed, then using this basic of finding dip and strike, you can figure out that what is the dip and strike of this bed which you actually do not see. So, this is something very interesting of this kind of problems. There should be some problems associated with this and uh, uh, the demonstrations of this lab works uh, would be given along with this, uh, this week's uh, lecture series. So, uh, with this I conclude uh, this week's lecture because we will have a handful of uh, demonstrations which are very useful and would be uploaded in this week by the teaching assistants. So, I request you to check them and practice. I not only conclude the lecture of this week uh, as your instructor, but I also sign off uh, from this course because this is the last lecture. Uh, I thank you very much for joining this course and uh, I particularly enjoyed a lot in teaching this course. Uh, I learnt a lot as well. I hope this course was useful for you and I still remain uh, at your disposal questions. If you have any uh, ideas that you would like to discuss with me, you are more than welcome uh, to write me uh, through my email. So, thank you very much, stay well, I hope I will see you again with another series of lectures. Thank you.